In today's tutorial, we're going to create this particular super simple sci-fi animation loop. We're going to try and keep it beginner friendly, and we're going to be learning quite a bit about UV unwrapping and also a little bit of compositing. Let's go ahead and begin today's tutorial. In our default scene, we're going to go ahead and tap X to delete the default cube. Then we'll press Shift A and search for a curved circle. Now the curved circle can be manipulated by pressing tab to go into edit mode, or you can use this drop down over here and switch from object mode to edit mode. Then you can select the individual vertices and play around with them. For now, I'm just going to take this and press G to move and then move it on the Y axis by tapping Y and I'll just move it out. Maybe I'll take this one and move it on the Y axis as well. Then I can select both of these by shift and select and then press G followed by Z and move it up on the Z axis. Similarly, I can play around with these as much as I want to get whatever shape I desire. But to actually get a better look at the shape, I'll go ahead and press tab to go into object mode, select the camera from the outliner or from here over here, and then I'll just press this button to go into the camera view. Then I'll press Alt G to clear the location, followed by Alt R to clear the rotation. Then I'll press R followed by X and then 90 to rotate it on the X axis by 90 degrees. Then I'll go ahead and select the Bezier circle once again. And if I just zoom out, I can see that the Bezier circle is all the way out there. So I can either scale the Bezier circle in or I can take the camera, go down to the camera properties, and decrease the focal length down to something like 12 just to give it a much wider field of view. Now I actually like this wider field of view because the edges of the object are going to be a lot more prominent. So I'm going to keep it like this and then play around with it till I get something that I like. So let's press G, Z to move the entire object a lot lower. Then I'm going to go ahead and select it, go down to the curve properties and increase the resolution all the way to 64. Then I'll go back into edit mode by pressing tab and selecting this particular vertex and then just rotating it to give it some sort of a unique shape. This can be completely up to you and your creative imagination. But for the time being, I'm actually going to go out of the camera view and make a few more selections such as these. And then I'll just move it on the Y axis to bring it front so that the curvature can be seen within my camera view. So let's just move these a little bit lower. And I think I want the entire thing to be rotated on the X axis, or I can just select this and then press G Y and bring it closer so that we can actually see it go back up. Remember, the shape is completely your own this design choice and you don't even have to go in a line. You can even make a loop by just rotating this like that. And it's really up to you and what your preference is. You can always scale these up and down as well. And if you want, you can just shift select these and then click segments subdivide to create a new vertex point over there. Now you can just move these, scale these up as well, or just smoothen out the geometry as you feel seems to work the best. Once you're happy with the way everything looks, you can go down to the curve properties, expand the geometry tab over here, and then go down to the bevel and increase the bevel depth to something like maybe 0.1. If you want, you can always increase this even more, but I think for now I'll keep it at 0.12 itself. Then I'm going to go ahead and make the final changes to my entire system. Maybe add in another subdivision or another vertex right there in the middle and just grab that out to make it a little smoother, rotate it by a little bit, scale it up a bit, and that should be good. So now that we have all of these created, we can go ahead and actually press tab to go into object mode and start playing around with the material. For the material, we have to go ahead and first switch on our viewport shading to rendered so that we can actually see what material it is. And then we can go down to the material properties and press this plus button to create a new material. To actually change these, we're gonna bring our cursor to the junction of these two windows, click and drag to create a new window, and then switch this from the 3D viewport to the shader editor. Then I'll tap the end button to remove that side panel and then scroll in just so that I can see the nodes better. Essentially what I want is the entire thing to be metallic, but I want the emission to occur to allow for streaks to move along this particular tube. To get that, I'm going to press shift A and search for a color ramp node and a noise texture. So let's press shift A, search for a noise texture as well, and plug this color into the factor and this color ramp output can go into the strength. Next, we actually need to play around with this. So we're going to bring this black in so that we can see the texture a lot better. Let's bring in the white as well so that it's a lot more contrasty. And then we'll select the noise texture and press control T with the node wrangler enabled to get the texture coordinate and mapping nodes. Remember, you can always press shift A and add in the texture coordinate nodes and shift A and add in the mapping nodes separately. Next, right now, if we play around by moving along the X, we don't 
see it move along this particular curve. So we can try the Y and that also doesn't give the same effect and neither does Z. And that's because we're using the generated coordinates. To make it move along this particular curve, we're going to have to use the UV coordinates. Now there's going to be a few issues that you might notice while using the UV coordinates. Right now, if we play around with the Y, you can see that it is moving, but there's a clear hard seam right over there. So it seems like the texture is emerging from here and ending over here. That will occur at least at one place along this particular curve. So along this curve, that happens right over here. So if we go back into the camera view, we can see that hard seam being created as we move along the X axis. So that is something that we definitely don't want. Apart from that, you can also see that this is fairly hard edged over there. So to make that a lot smoother, we're going to have to go over to the object data properties and under the bevel, just increase the resolution until it becomes nice and smooth. I'm actually going to keep the resolution at 32. Now that it is smooth, we have to deal with this scene. And also we will notice that there's another scene that you can see going along right over there. So as we move anything around, there is a hard scene present right over there. So that is another thing that we have to actually remove to make this nice and smooth. Since it has to occur at least at one position, what we want is to have that scene pr be present somewhere that the camera cannot see. So maybe up here. The way we're going to do that is by playing around with the UVs. So we can actually click and drag to create a new window over here and then just switch this to the UV editor. Then if you actually press tab, you see we don't get access to the faces. So to actually play around with the UVs, you need to convert this from a curve to a mesh. Ensure that you're very happy with the shape of the curve and the positioning before you do this. So if you're completely sure that you're happy with it, you can go ahead and go to object, choose convert and convert to mesh. Now, when you press tab to go into edit mode, you see that you have vertices instead of the curve. So now we have to actually go ahead and change this. So in order to change this, what we do is we press A to select everything and you can see the grid present over here. Although the grid is very smooth, you can see that the grid does end in one position and ends over here. Same thing goes over there. This entire grid is actually wrapped around the sphere. So the way we change this is by tapping U and clicking unwrap and we can unwrap it based on a few different options that we have. However, before we do this, we want to mark where we want the new seams to be. So to mark the new seams, let's go over to our edge selection mode and select an edge loop that's present outside the camera view. So for now, we're going to select this edge loop present up here. And let's just go ahead and press Alt followed by Shift and then select to select an entire edge loop. Now, if you have anything else selected, we don't want those. So let's just reselect by Alt Shift Select. Now let's go over to our camera view and ensure that we cannot actually see what we just selected. And since we can't, that seems like a good edge loop to select. For example, if we had selected maybe Alt Shift click over here and we then go into a camera view, we would be able to see that edge seam over here, which is not what we want. So ensure that you keep trying until you get a nice edge loop that we can't really select or we cannot see through the camera lens. Apart from that, we also need one that goes around the particular torus. So let's Alt Shift click this particular edge loop and that should select this. Now that we have these, we need to mark these as seams. Let's press U and then choose mark seam. So now that the seams are marked, remember you could have also done that by clicking UV mark seam over here. We can see that these will actually form the new seams for when we unwrap it. So let's press A to select everything and then tap U and then choose unwrap and you can choose angle based or minimum stretch for this operation. Let's go ahead and choose angle based for now. And right after a slight calculation, we see that the new UVs are present right over here like this, and it's fairly uniform. However, if we were to just deselect everything by double tapping A, you can see that the new edge is formed right here. And if you were to play around with this, the edge is present always along these axes or along these edges that you just created or so-called the seams. Now, if you were to go ahead and view this, it is no longer going to be seen as a seam, but because you unwrapped it in a new way, the new axis, which we have to move along is the Y axis to get it to go or to get it to seem like it's moving along this particular curve. So as long as we play around with the Y axis, we should be fine. So now we can press tab to go back into object mode and we can just switch off overlays by pressing this button. And then we can just bring this back up so that we can see more of this. Now I want this to look like streaks. 
So in order to get it to look like streaks, I'm actually going to just increase the scale on the X axis by quite a bit. Let's increase it to maybe something like 50. And let's just decrease the Y axis value to something like 0.5. And that should make the streaks look like really good streaks. Next, we need to give these streaks some color. To give it color, I actually want it to go through maybe a Voronoi texture. But before we get to that, I also want it to loop. So we will be adding a few nodes present right over here. But we'll deal with that when we get to the animation section. So to get the Voronoi texture, I'll just press Shift A and search for a Voronoi texture node. Now I'm going to go ahead and select this and plug that into the vector input. And I'm going to take the color output and plug that into a color ramp. So let's press Shift D to create a new color ramp, plug the color into the factor, and then I could just select the color ramp and press the backspace to reset the color ramp. Then I'm just going to press this plus button to create a new top. And then I'll go ahead and select maybe two or three colors. So maybe I'll go ahead and have a pink color here and an orangish color here. And the reason why I want this to be RGB is because now I can select this middle color ramp and make it a red just like that. We could have gotten a very similar effect by just having two stops and changing this from RGB to HSV. However, I feel like the red is not enough in HSV. So I can just go to RGB, add in that new stop, make it red and I can play around with these to ensure that the red comes towards this side or that side. So I just get a little bit more control. Now let's plug this color into the actual color and see what color we get. Along with that, I also want to change this base color from white to black and I'm going to select this light and I'm going to go ahead and delete it. Now that I have this, I think I require a little bit more red as well. So I'm just going to control click to create a new stop and just pull these outward so that we get more areas to be red. I'm going to bring this orange in so that there's some more orange and pink in just like that. Now that we have that color created, I want this to be a lot brighter. So I'll move the color ramp to the side. I'll press Shift A, search for a math node. I'll switch this over from add to multiply and I will multiply this by a large value. Let's go with something like five or maybe 10. And the brighter you go, the more the bloom effect is going to come in. So in fact, maybe I can just keep it at 15 for now. Now that we have that created, we can go ahead and create the animation. For the animation, I'm going to go over to my output properties. I'll change the resolution to 200 so that it's a 4K animation. I'll change the frame rate to maybe 60 frames per second. And I'll change the end frame to something like 600 so that we get a 10 second long animation. Or maybe we can actually do 1200 so that it's 20 seconds long. Now the output folder, I'm going to save it at whatever folder we save the blend file by pressing double slash, and I'm going to change the file format to FFmpeg video. The encoding, I'm going to change the container to MPEG4 with an output quality set to perceptually lossless. Then the next thing that I'm going to have to do is expand this and go over to frame zero and go over to this particular mapping section and play around with this particular texture. The way I'm going to get this to loop is by changing the texture coordinate itself to go from linear coordinates to circular coordinates so that a movement by two pi radians on maybe the y axis equivalents to one full rotation or in the circular coordinate space. If you want to see a little more detail of this, you can check out this video over here, but we'll just make the basic setup because it's really fast in this video once again. In order to get the setup, the first thing that I'm going to do is with the node wrangler enabled, I'll press shift right click and drag along these two lines to create a new node just so that I can move this around and add in single nodes over here, which will act to both this and this over here. So to create the new nodes, the nodes are going to be a separate XYZ followed by a combined XYZ. Let's press shift A, search for a separate XYZ and let's press shift A and search for a combined XYZ. Then let's go ahead and just connect the X to the X, the Y to the Y and the Z to the Z. This in principle should have absolutely no effect on what it was previously. However, to convert this to circle, circular coordinates, we're going to press shift A, search for a math node and change this from add to sign and plug that in right over the X. And then I'll press shift A and search for another math node, or I can select this and press shift D to duplicate it, plug that in over here and change this from sine to cosine. Now, if we actually play around with the Y coordinate, it should still seem like it's moving. However, if we were to go to zero, and then go to two star pi, we should see that it is the exact same, which means it will be perfectly looping. So on frame zero, I'm gonna change the Y value to zero and I'll just tap I, and then I'll go over all the way to frame 1200 and I'll change this Y value to something like two star pi. And remember, if you want it to be twice as fast, you can make it four star pi and 
any even multiple of pi. Then I'll hover over it and tap I, and then I'll select this. I'll go down here and I'll press T linear just so that we get it to go as a smooth loop and not slow down at the beginning, speed up in the middle and slow down at the end, which would happen with the default Bezier. Now that we have all of that done, we can play around with the backgrounds and things like that. So for the background, I'm going to actually go over to the world properties and change this background color to a much darker color and maybe make it a little bluish, which is complementary to the pinks, or maybe make it reddish as well. It's really up to you. I just don't want it to be pitch black. Similarly, I want the camera to be a little lower. So I'll select the camera, press G Z after selecting the camera outline. And if you have your overlay switched off, you won't be able to select it in the viewport. So just select it over there. Press G, Z, bring it down by a little bit. And then I'll add in a plane. So I'll press Shift A, search for mesh plane. And I'll press G, Z to bring it down just below the curve. So I'll press S followed by 20 and then just bring it below the curve. So G, Z and bring it down just about there. Remember, if you want, you could always artistically choose to have it go through this particular plane, but all of that is personal preference. Next, to have nice reflections on the plane, I'm going to switch on ray tracing. So I'll go over to the render properties and switch on ray tracing over there. Now you can see how this actually affects the light on the floor. I want the floor to be a lot more reflective. So I'll press this new button to create a new material. And if you can't actually see the nodes, you can just click view frame selected or frame all or the period on your numpad. Then I'm going to increase the metallicness so that we get much better reflection and the roughness could be kept at any arbitrary value. So something like that might seem nice. You might want exact reflections, just a little bit of roughness, generally add some realism. Or if you just want the light to spread, you can increase the roughness quite a bit. However, I like it a lot more with some texture. So I'm going to press shift A and search for a noise texture and I'll plug that color into the roughness. To get more control, I'll press Shift A and search for a color ramp node, and I'll plug that in right over there. Then I'll bring this in and this in, and I'm just gonna increase the scale until we actually see the texture. Similarly, I'm gonna increase the detail and just play around with the roughness until I get something that I like. And to be fair, I want it to be a lot more reflective, so let's bring it to something like that. Then I don't want it to be completely reflective, so I'm just gonna change the black to a value of maybe something like 0.15, and I'll change this white to a value of maybe something like 0.8 so that it's not completely non-reflective. Now that looks good for me. Similarly, I could always add in some more textures like the Voronoi texture, just plug the color into the vector and things like that to get various different variations. You could always play around with color. You could maybe use the distance, play around with the scale. All of these will result in different types of textures on the floor. Similarly, you don't have to have the Voronoi before, you could have the Voronoi texture after. Ensure that you play around with the scales accordingly just to get different looks. Maybe have the distance go into the color ramp and play around with it till you're happy. For now, I'll just control X to, for now, I'll just shift delete. For now, I'm just going to delete this and use the noise texture itself for this render. The next thing that I want is a nice bloom effect, which we'll add in with compositing. For that, I'll go over from the shader editor to the compositor. And then I'll check this button that says use nodes. Then I'll press shift A and search for a glare node, which I'm going to then change from streaks to bloom. And to actually see what's happening, I'm going to actually go over to this particular render section and expand this and choose compositor to be enabled in the camera view as well. Similarly, I'll go to my camera, go down to the camera properties, expand the viewport display and increase pass part two all the way to one so that I do not see anything outside my camera view. Now the bloom effect seems a lot too strong. So I'm just going to reduce this mix all the way down to something like minus 0.85. Once I'm happy with the way everything looks, I can just play along with the animation once or twice to see that everything does look good in fact. And then I'm going to go over to the last thing, which is under my camera properties. I'm going to switch on depth of field. I'll expand this, reduce the f-stop all the way to zero to enhance the effect quite a bit. And then I'll play around with the focus distance until I just get that last little area to be in focus. So I think something like that is what I'm looking for. Once I'm happy with the way everything looks, I can go ahead and press render animation. I hope this tutorial taught you something about compositing UV maps and how you can go ahead and change the seams for different textures. Along with that, maybe you learned how to loop textures, but if you want to learn how to loop textures even better or create a custom looping node as well, you can check out this video over here. In fact, I will be creating one where we learn how to loop it in the geometry nodes as well with a lot more functionality, which will deal with 
in a future video. So until those videos come out, thank you so much for watching. Keep creating and don't forget to stay creative.